Hi, and welcome to the fourth episode of our Drawing Your Path to Success video series. I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the Department of Game and Fish. And with me today is Travis Zaffirano, the uh, Program Manager for the Department. So, uh, as I said, this is the fourth episode in the series. We're going to continue to come out with these each Friday at uh, 5 o'clock through the end of the draw. So our last episode will be coming out March 17th. Um, that'll all be released on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we do have some upcoming deadlines to, to be concerned about. Uh, March 22nd is the final deadline for the big game draw and also the final deadline for getting your harvest reports in. Uh, unless it's Barbary, Ibex, Havelina, an Oryx, or a Trapper license, uh, those are due April 7th. But make sure you get those harvest reports in, or else all of your draw applications will be rejected, and uh, nobody wants that. So uh, make sure you get those in. So without further ado, uh, Travis, um, what's new for elk hunters this year in New Mexico? Yeah, thanks, Jim, um, and hello, everybody online. Yeah, so this last year, uh, brought about our four-year elk rule cycle development. Uh, every four years we come together and look at populations of elk across the state. Um, we try to consider some of the public input um, that goes into how many licenses we allocate for each of the units. Um, we try to try to take into consideration biological factors as well as uh, social components uh, to try to draft up uh, the number of licenses and what our, our hunt seasons look like um, for the next four years. So we just finished that rule cycle um, this last October, uh, and that goes into effect this uh, this upcoming hunt season. So in September of 2023, we'll uh, we'll start seeing those changes to um, to the elk cycle or the the elk rule rather, uh, and those rules will be in place until um, 2026, the hunt season of 2026. So. Mm -hmm. um, a few different changes. Um, for the most part, everybody will be happy to know that uh, elk, elk populations across the state are, are doing rather well. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, our elk populations are either stable or slightly increasing, uh, with the exception of the Mount Taylor herd. Um, we, have, uh, we have seen some recovering of uh, recruitment and calf survival in that herd, uh, but we're just not quite to the level yet where we feel comfortable increasing the number of licenses mm -hmm. uh, available, at least through the public draw. So um, we're, we're hoping that in the next four years, we have some projects on the horizon that are gonna help to bring uh, that population back around. Uh, but at this time, we, we're still kind of buffering that population from, from extra harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so some key changes and differences uh, that have come in the, in the new uh, elk rule cycle. Um, we have seen some increases in elk licenses. Uh, in the north central area in the San Juan Mountains and uh, in the Bias Caldera. Um, along the Canadian River, uh, we were able to increase some of the licenses in there. Uh, we have new archery hunts in the northeast portion of the state, so the mountainous regions just east of Raton. Um, we're, we're implementing some new archery hunts in that area, um, both because we have increases in population and also uh, we just wanted to increase the opportunity for archery hunters in that region. Um, we have some new uh, antlerless hunts available in January, early February, in the Sacramento Mountains in GMUs 34 and 36. Um, and this is mostly to uh, put some more pressure on that female portion of the segment, um, as that is probably the, the fastest growing elk uh, population in the state. Uh, I'm sure many people are well aware that uh, they can be a little bit problematic, the number of elk that we have down in Sacramento. Uh, mountains, and so we're trying to increase that harvest pressure on the female portion. Uh, we also have some new antlerless hunts in GMU 23. Um, we have some concerns with uh, overpopulation of elk in areas that we uh, try to manage for uh, quality deer hunt uh, and deer habitat, and so uh, we'll see some new licenses available in Unit 23 as well. Uh, and we actually increased the number of youth encouragement hunts uh, in GMUs 13, 34, and 36. Um, so, so good news there. We got a lot of uh, a lot of new opportunities for hunters to, to get out and hunt elk across the state. Uh, we also saw some increases in huntable public land across the state. Uh, in GMUs 13, we saw an expansion of the primary management zone, um, and so this now includes uh, an area near the El Malpais uh, National Monument. Um, which was previously managed under the secondary management zone, 
Um, that'll all be included in the primary management zone and available to public hunters um, that get a license through the public draw. Um, we've also seen an expansion of the primary management zone in GMU 17, um, just north of the San Mateo Mountains. And this is a, in an effort to kind of standardize the way that elk are managed uh, in the San Mateo Mountain area. Uh, there was just kind of a pocket of secondary management zone with both public and private properties held within that uh, we transferred to the primary management zone. So those lands will now be available to public hunters that get licenses through the draw. Um, the Department of Game and Fish purchased a large chunk of land in uh, GMU 9 outside of Mount Taylor, um, close to the Marquez Wildlife Management Area. Mm -hmm. uh, and this area is, is slotted to be um, a spot for a few different uh, projects, again, like I mentioned earlier, to kind of uh, promote populations in the Mount Taylor region. Uh, and those areas will be open to public hunters uh, beginning in the hunt season of 2023. Uh, there's some specific licenses uh, that you'll see in the proclamation um, specifically for that, that new uh, wildlife management area. Um, I believe it's going to be called the L-Bar um, mm. after, after the, the ranch. Um, uh, additionally, there's, uh, there's going to be some changes, uh, some expansions of GMUs, and so uh, GMU 39 is now going to be combined with uh, GMU 43. Um, these are both in the secondary management zone, but there are uh, public draw licenses that are available um, for those units. And uh, now hunters that apply for units uh, 39, uh, they'll be combined with GMU 43 just to increase the, the land in which those hunters can hunt. Um, and hopefully have a little bit more success. And the same case is gonna be true for GMUs 30 and 29. Uh, we combine those two units for uh, public draw hunts. Uh, again, just to, uh, as the elk are expanding south out of the Sacramento Mountains, uh, we wanna give hunters the opportunity to, to have a little bit better um, chance of success down there. So, so units 29 and 30 are now combined uh, for those public draw hunts. So um, other than that, uh, there's been a little bit of a decrease in licenses, especially for mature bulls in some of the greater Gila uh, areas. So if that's your your main focus for public draw hunts, um, take a look. Some of those uh, early October uh, hunts, uh, mid mid October hunts, have seen a decrease in the number of licenses, and then mostly that's just due to the fact that we do have really high success rates in some of those early rifle hunts, um, and the Gila National Forest and all of those GMUs are managed as a quality hunt management zone. And so we want to be able to try to preserve some of that genetic class, uh, let some of, those, some of those mature bulls get to the older age class so that, uh, so that we can kind of perpetuate the older age classes in those quality management zones. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do pay attention to that. There is a slight decrease in the number of bull licenses in those Gila uh, early hunts. Um, some other changes, uh, we did see a shift from uh, the special management zone in Unit 46. Um, unit 46 is now secondary management zone. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that we have a lot of elk that are coming out of the, the Pecos wilderness area, uh, the Pecos River drainage. Uh, they end up down into in the lowlands, a lot of agricultural fields down there, a lot of private property. Um, the, a lot of those elk are, are no longer migratory uh, back up into the high country in the summertime. Uh, they've become a little bit more residential and shifting from special management zone over into secondary management zone gives those landowners a little bit more flexibility in getting some licenses, uh, getting some hunters on the ground to put some pressure on the elk that are there uh, pretty much year round now. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there are people who say that we ought to kind of back off on our cow hunt. So a little bit, but it seems like we've kind of actually got a pretty conservative strategy when it, it comes to managing the, the cow population. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, and, and Darren, that's, that's right. Uh, it's, a lot of people do bring this up. Um, you know, we do har harvest quite a few cows. I mean, if you look at our, our annual harvest, um, I believe last year's cow harvest was somewhere uh, around 6,500 cows. Um, but we do have a higher proportion of harvest rates on the male segment of the population. Um, males are, uh, you're, you have a little bit more flexibility to be able to harvest males from a population because they're not as um, crucial to the population in terms of population productivity, um, right? So, so one bull can sire uh, 
many calves through through several uh, different options with with avenues of several cows. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually have a pretty conservative uh, harvest model for cows, um, with the exception of areas where we do have an over and abundance of cows and, and a large population of elk. Um, so some, in some areas of the Sacramento Mountains, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we are actually increasing our pressure on the female segment of that population because we do have an overabundance and a highly productive elk herd. Um, but for the most part, we, we try to harvest um, fewer uh, animals than our model uh, estimates that we can harvest to have a sustainable population. Mm -hmm. Another thing that came up, uh, some people will put in for a, a late season bow hunt and then wonder why it was that their, their bow hunt didn't come before the rifle hunt, during the rut. Um, you know, obviously we do offer, as a department, we do offer um, some early season bow hunts, but what would you say is the, the biggest difference between what you're gonna see during an early season bow hunt versus a late season bow hunt? Sure, yeah, and, th and this can be pretty frustrating. Um, I have to imagine that anybody that puts in for an archery hunt, uh, not realizing that they, that they chose a late season archery hunt mm -hmm. uh, would be fairly disappointed uh, once they recognize that their bow hunt is now in December. Mm -hmm. um, but there's only a couple of options that are available for those December bow hunts, um, and those are in units 37 and 34. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that the, the department developed these hunts, and it's been a few years now since we've done this, um, the, a couple different reasons. One is just to increase the, the opportunity for archery hunters. Um, there, we can we can allocate more licenses through an archery hunt um, because we recognize that less of those archery hunters are going to be successful. But we do offer the opportunity for those hunters to get out there and har and harvest an animal. Um, and the reasons for that kind of late season um, after the rifle hunt is is it gives a lot of the private landowners in those areas an opportunity to. Uh, maybe they're having some issues with elk depredation or damaging of their fences as elk are moving down into the lower elevations onto winter range. Mm -hmm. um, and so this opens up a little bit of an opportunity for those private landowners to say, hey, I've got some elk on my property. You know, if you've got a tag, we can work something out where you mm -hmm. can come out um, and maybe harvest one of those. And, and, a, and a big question that, that tends to come up why is it that the department carries out elk surveys and how is that data used? And also, when do we typically do those surveys? Yeah, great question. Um, this, is, this is my life, uh, this is starting in, <laughs> in late summer and leading into uh, early fall. Um, it's, it's a big logistical planning um, challenge. Uh, this last year, we had three helicopters flying in various parts of the state. Um, all surveying simultaneously to get the job done in the window that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so every year um, between the end of the archery season and the beginning of uh, most units muzzleloader season, uh, we do our aerial surveys for elk classifications. Um, <clears throat> and primarily what we use this information for is to get an understanding of how that population is doing. Um, so we're looking to uh, assess what the calf uh, recruitment late rates look like, uh, how many of those calves are surviving from year to year and are recruited into the breeding population, um, what proportion of the bulls that we have on the landscape are considered uh, older age class bulls, um, and what is our bull to cow ratio, what is our calf to cow ratio. Uh, essentially, it's, it's uh, an annual census, if you will, uh, to try to determine what the population uh, productivity looks like on the landscape. And we recognize that we, there's no way we're gonna count every elk on the, on the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but on average, we do count between 10 and, 10 and 12,000 elk uh, during those surveys. Um, and we use that information combined with what our hunters provide through their harvest success surveys. Um, and we use that information to uh, build a population model. Um, it reconstructs the population to say, uh, if you harvested this many animals and your population demographic rates look like this, then you must have had a population of 
this many individuals to be able to support that. And then from there, we can actually extrapolate and, and we use that information to determine, okay, how many animals can we sustainably harvest from that population uh, this year, the next year, and so on and so forth, given those, those population metrics. So, so it's a way for us to understand how those populations are doing. Um, and, and then it really, you know, it allows us to kind of assess any of those red flags. And so, uh, you know, it was that information that led us to decreasing and, and ultimately getting rid of a lot of the public draw licenses for cows in the Mount Taylor herd unit um, mm -hmm. because those calf recruitment uh, numbers were so low. And so it's, it really is, is the best way, uh, the most efficient way to, to gather that population information. Mm -hmm. and, and you've been talking a lot about that, uh, the Mount Taylor herd. Um, what is the status of that population? I know that the department has put a lot of work into, into studying that population over the, the past several years. Yeah, yeah, and you're certainly not the first person to ask me this. Um, it has been kind of a highlight of, of some department uh, funding and, and energy over the last several years. Um, the department noticed a, a pretty uh, precipitous decline in the calf recruitments and their survival rates, I believe, starting in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2015, the department began a research study to, to look at um, what are the survival rates, what are the cause-specific uh, mortalities look like for those calves, and what are the survival rates for the adult cows. And so between 2015 and 2019, the department funded a research study to um, deploy GPS collars on both adult females and calves uh, in that herd segment to learn more about their habitat use, um, as well as you know, what are the leading causes of mortality for those calves? Um, and so from that, we've learned a lot about kind of some of the, the critical calving areas uh, for that herd, um, some of the habitats that they use and, and where they concentrate their time and, uh, and what habitats they're selecting for during that critical calving period, um, as well as look at, you know, what are the predation rates for the different predators on the landscape? How many are be t being taken by black bears? how many are being taken by mountain lions and coyotes. Um, and from there, we're, we're actually, um, we're starting to, you know, improve some of the habitat on the landscape. We're doing some fence modification and, and fence removal uh, projects up there. There's a lot of kind of holdover uh, net wire livestock fencing that's, that's pretty detrimental uh, to those calves that can't move through that landscape as easily and evade predation. Um, so we have some, some fence modification projects on the ground. Um, and in, in addition, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with that uh, acquisition of the Elbar property for the game and fish, uh, there's, there's a lot of potential for some habitat improvement uh, on that landscape as well, uh, maybe bringing some waters uh, and maybe some, some thinning projects, uh, things, things that are on the horizon to be able to help uh, bolster that population further. Uh, the good news is we have seen a recurrence and, and um, an uptick in the calf recruitment in the last several years. Um, it's just not, we're just not comfortable enough to release tags uh, to begin hunting that population just we're, yet. We're almost there, we're just not quite there. Almost there. <laughs> Fingers crossed that yeah. sometime in the next couple of years we, we can get there and uh, open that up. I'd certainly like to draw a tag from my dealer. <laughs> <laughs> and how was the uh, study in the Gila going? Yeah, so that's another big project that the department has been involved with in the last several years. Um, in, in 2018, we began a collaborative research project with New Mexico State University um, and the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit down there. Uh, we've got a wonderful team of graduate students, both PhD and master's students that are working on uh, various aspects of looking at the impacts of the recovering Mexican gray wolf population mm -hmm. and its and its effects on uh, the elk population. Um, so there's, there's three different kind of objectives um, that we're focusing on with this project. Um, and all of this is kind of coming about with, with um, GPS location data, as well as on the ground observations. Um, and we're collaborating pretty heavily with uh, those New Mexico, student, New Mexico State University students um, to kind of facilitate uh, what questions need to be answered and, and what kind of things we want to see uh, 
to be able to project forward with you know knowing what the elk populations are doing uh, in concert with those Mexican gray wolves. Um, and so there's three different objectives, and the, the first of which is is what changes, if any, are there in habitat use for elk in the Gila? Um, you know, in the high density wolf use areas, um, are those habitat use changes any different than what is being seen uh, at the lower end of the spectrum where there's not as many wolves, right? And, and how can we expect some of those elk to change their behaviors uh, in the presence of, of more and more wolves as they, as they uh, become more abundant? Um, so there's been some pretty interesting things that have come out of that, um, looking at the differences in the timing in which uh, elk are using some of those uh, habitats based on uh, the number of wolves or the density of wolves rather. Um, and that's, it's pretty interesting to see um, the adaptability of, of these elk in their abilities to avoid predation. Um, second objective on that project is to look at um, direct predation of both adult females uh, and of calves from that year. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some might be ex uh, excited to learn that not very many elk calves are being preyed upon by, by wolves. Um, and it makes sense if you think about it from an ecological standpoint. Um, wolves are predatory animals that hunt in packs. Uh, you know, elk calves are, are fairly small meal. Um, mm -hmm. So they don't really focus a lot of energy on going after calves. There are there are higher uh, levels of predation on adult females, um, but it's actually um, secondary to the levels of predation that we're seeing for mountain lions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a fairly interesting um, discovery from that. And the third objective is to look at the changes in behavior um, for the the groups of elk that are across this gradient of, of wolf density. And to see how those how those behaviors are different, um, and in some of the areas with a higher wolf density, uh, we're seeing shifts in in behavior both in the habitat use, but also in their ability to uh, multitask. Uh, in in I guess an example of that would be uh, often when when elk are are bedded and, and vigilant or vigilant searching uh, for you know, predators on the landscape, they see something move, you know, you get that typical ears up, mm -hmm. erect, eyes wide open, real stiff stance. Well, some of these elk that are in the higher density wolf areas, they'll actually, they'll continue to chew their cud, whether they're bedded or whether they're standing or mm -hmm. moving. Uh, these two behaviors are usually mutually exclusive, um, but the, these guys that are, are adapting to knowing that there's predators on the landscape or more predators, are, are shifting their behaviors to be able to be a little bit more efficient uh, and, and keep an eye out while they're still producing or while they're still performing their day-to-day -day tasks. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I guess when, uh, when that's your situation, you really have no other choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously one of the, the big events uh, last year, we had the, the huge Calf Canyon Her Hermit's Peak fire. How, how has that affected the uh, elk herds up north? You're surprisingly enough, Darren. You're not the first person to ask <laughs> about this. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there that are they're uh, fairly concerned about the, uh, you know, what's going to happen. What are the effects of these large scale fires on on our game populations? And um, you'll be happy to know that. For the most part, uh, a lot of the Calf Canyon and the Hermit's Peak fire burned at a lower, moderate severity burn. Um, that means that there was some canopy death in, in some of those areas, but for the most part, a lot of it burned on the understory, uh, burning up some of those uh, ladder fuels and ground fuels and opening it back up to be uh, really good foraging habitat. So grasses and forbs really like to come back um, after that nutrients has been recycled into the soil um, and actually can provide uh, increased uh, health benefits and forage productivity, uh, which those elk key into uh, usually within the first year after a burn. Now, that isn't to say that there hasn't been loss of habitat. Mm -hmm. There are certainly some areas, uh, especially um, landscapes with steep topography. Um, after the fires came, we had uh, you know, fairly substantial monsoon season. And, uh, you know, in those areas where uh, you had high levels of canopy death, 
uh, and the first few inches of the soil had actually gotten really hot and, and burned away uh, the seed banks and everything that um, was surviving in the soils. A lot of those areas, um, yeah, unfortunately you did see a lot of this, the topsoil washing away with the monsoons, um, and it'll take several years for that to recover. Um, but I think it is going to be offset by the, the grand uh, number of acreage that burned in the low and moderate severity so long as we get enough moisture in the spring and then again in the monsoon season, that, that'll actually benefit elk mm -hmm. uh, in the northern part of the state. Mm -hmm. You were talking about uh, predation earlier and uh, its effect on the elk population. Uh, what is the, the general effect, especially on, on calves? Yes, yeah, certainly. So there, there can be a rather large impact of, of predation on especially the young calves. Uh, in an elk population. Um, so depending on what part of the state you're in, uh, we have a full suite of predators down in the Gila, uh, including black bears, mountain lions, coyotes, and the Mexican gray wolf. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of predation from the Mexican gray wolves in, in that area, um, but black bears and coyotes especially um, do have uh, quite, a, quite an impact on the survival of elk calves, especially in that first six weeks of life. Um, you know, it's a natural part of the cycle. Um, we, we understand that, you know, not every calf is going to survive into the reproductive portion of that population. And our models do take that into consideration. That's why, you know, that's, uh, that survey data is so important. Um, but it is also something that we try to incorporate into our management decisions. Um, for instance, just in the last year or so, uh, the ability for trapping of predators on public property um, has been removed. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, there's only allowance of trapping of predators on private properties uh, if those private property owners choose to do so. And so in areas uh, like in the Valles Caldera, for instance, uh, within the Caldera itself, they don't have any, any management or, or um, predator control within the Valles Caldera because it's owned and operated at the federal level by the National Park Service. Um, but outside of that is, a, is really a large tract of national forest land that now is going to have no uh, pressure on that predator segment. And so uh, in areas like that where we are a little concerned about, you know, the, the amount of predation and how, how much that predation is going to put pressure on the calf part of the uh, of the population, you know, we try to take into consideration that, uh, you know, we're, we do have an abundance of predators on the ground, um, and maybe we need to, uh, you know, adjust those licenses or adjust what our management objectives are for those herds. Uh, maybe not on the four-year cycle, but we can take a look at that annually and, and decide if we need to intervene. intervene. Well, is there uh, anything else that, that you'd like to add that uh, the, the public ought to know before they uh, put in their applications for an elk license this year? Yeah, um, really, I, I would just uh, warn those that are going to be putting in for the public draw. Um, because we did just have our, our new rule development cycle, um, all of the hunt codes are going to be changed um, from top to bottom. You know, if you're used to applying for the same hunt code every year because that's your that's your spot, that's your unit, um, I, I highly advise you to take a look at the hunt codes, pay attention to that because they have all changed. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, uh, be on the lookout for some of those uh, some of those additional antlerless hunts uh, down in the Sacramento. If that's um, what you're interested in, look in the fill your freezer. There's some uh, more opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, uh, I just warn those that um, are muzzleloader hunters, um, just re a reminder that um, the designation of muzzleloaders now uh, is more of a primitive weapon uh, mm -hmm. that does not include uh, any magnified scope. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking to get back to more of that uh, open sights um, type of hunt weapon. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time, Travis. Uh, some valuable information for uh, for everybody wanting to apply for an elk license this year, and uh, you know, hopefully, this uh, helps all of you as you uh, as you put in your uh, draw applications. Um, again, a reminder that the deadline for the big game draw is March twenty second at five o'clock. Um, make sure that you get it in before five o'clock because if you are in the middle of your application at five o'clock and five o'clock strikes, 
uh, you will be kicked out of the system and uh, your application won't go through. Another big thing is that there is that harvest report deadline um, that you have to have that in by March 22nd, other than the exotics, which are due April 7th. And join us for our, our next episode in the series with uh, Tony Opatz, the uh, pronghorn biologist. That'll be coming out next Friday at 5 o'clock. And to watch other episodes in the series, uh, look us up on YouTube. Look up the Department of Game and Fish and look for our Drawing Your Path to Success playlist. All of the past episodes in this series are in that playlist and all future episodes will be added to it. So, for Travis Zafferano, I'm Darren Vaughn, and for our uh, cameraman Liam Phillips, thank you for watching and best of luck to you in the draw.